So listen to this. What's your favorite thing about football? Most players would probably say the magic, the passion, the fans, the competitiveness, you know, something like that. But when they asked Vinnie Jones, the man said, what I like the most is snapping the bones of my rivals. No wonder that if you search for his name, one of the suggestions Google makes is the word psycho. We're talking about a man who over his entire career had over 80 stitches across his head and his face. A man who has often been given the title of the most feared player of all time. Not because of his skills, but because of his complete lack of empathy and compassion. You gotta realize this, Vinnie Jones accumulated 104 yellow cards and was sent off 12 times over his 10 years playing in the Premier League. That's the second most ever in the competition, only behind Roy Keane, and let it be known, Keane played almost twice as many matches as Jones and only managed one more red card than him. And still, I know some of you will claim 12 is not much, but the thing is, he was at his prime in the 80s, back when lunging studs first into someone's knee would often receive no punishment. But still, among all of this, even if Jones displayed his disciplinary record like a trophy, what is often dismissed or I guess forgotten is that he was a talented footballer. An icon, a leader, who took center stage in some of the most memorable moments in English football and on the pitch, not only was he capable of pinging some impeccable long balls, but forgive me for the pun, the guy had a mean volley. <laughs> It's often questioned how far he could have gone if not for his mean streak, and well, according to many, in training, the guy was a delight to watch, he wouldn't hurt a fly. But as the man himself has said, at 2.55pm every Saturday, the moment I crossed that line, I had a chemical imbalance that immediately kicked in. And from that moment on, he turned into a monster. The moment I heard them say that, I became hopelessly curious to know what made them this way. And what I did not expect at all was that I would get the most cliché answer of all time. With Vinny once telling the press that back before he turned 12, he was a good kid. He played for Watford, never got into trouble, seemed destined to become a model citizen. But unfortunately, it was then that his parents got divorced, leading him to start acting out, making a streak of bad decisions that saw him quit football, leave his home and get into all kinds of trouble. In fact, he would only start calming down again by the time he turned 15, claiming it was getting back to football that sorted me out, it was the second chance that I needed. However, once he made it back, it seems Watford rejected him, supposedly considering him too short and too angry to make it in football which became stupidly ironic once he hit an incredible growth spurt that saw him hit 6 foot 2 before he had even turned 18, which paired with the fact that by then he had began working in construction had made him into a beast of a man, quickly earning him a spot among the backline of Wildstone FC. As you might imagine, playing non-league football only made him harder, rougher and more dangerous, which after two years in an FA Trophy, which is pretty much the non-league version of the FA Cup, strangely earned him a lone move to IFK Holmsund, in the fourth division of Swedish football, maybe the only place tougher than non-league. I mean, the guy debuted on a third pitch with a temperature of minus three degrees during a blizzard. Though, to be fair, while his Swedish teammates enter the pitch wearing long sleeves, leggings and beanies, Jones still stuck with his shorts, not even wearing anything underneath his jersey. Which might be why he quickly helped them achieve promotion, even shocking the country by leading them to the quarterfinals of the Swedish Cup, impressing Roy Hodgson, who at the time was coaching Malmo FF, finally getting his name out there at just the right time. Because you see, nothing of what I just said is as relevant to this story as what was happening in Wimbledon more than 1000 miles away. So, for the first time in their history and only 9 years after becoming a professional team, Wimbledon FC had just made it to the first tier of English football and they were there to cause trouble. As their manager would go on to say, we were a fairy tale, but our fairy tale was supposed to end with us going straight back down. That didn't happen, and nobody liked the fact that little Wimbledon came up and managed to stay up. By the end of that season, we were like a wasp every other club was trying to spot. And the thing is, Wimbledon FC were the perfect team for Jones. Their stadium was a dump. The exterior looked grim, the dressing rooms were a wreck, their thermostat always stuck at an unreasonably high temperature, the toilets didn't even flush, the stench was horrible. It was all designed to make the visitors as uncomfortable as possible and the worst was yet to come. 
As Wimbledon legend Fashanu would say, the tunnel was our secret weapon. It was the tunnel of doom. At halftime, it got dark. Things happened. The other players were scared. We made it so they weren't sure they would even come out the other side. And well, even if they did, the pitch was a muddy battlefield. The atmosphere was claustrophobic. It was psychological warfare. And it paid off. By the fifth match day of their first season at the top, Wimbledon were first on the table. And you know what's funny? I left out a bit of info regarding Vinny's time in Sweden. I left out that upon arrival, Holmstone had lied to the fans, claiming that Jones was on loan from Wimbledon, instead of admitting he was just some non-league player they had found. And fortunately for them, by January, once Wimbledon caught wind of this, instead of being mad, they were in awe. Because it took one look at Vinnie Jones to realize he was the perfect player for them, so instead of suing them, they paid Wildstone 10 grand and took Jones under their wing. And with the final piece added to the puzzle, the legendary Crazy Gang was formed, and Wimbledon turned into a pandemonium. Legends of what happened in practice behind closed doors are seemingly infinite. The pranks never stopped, players were stripped, forced to walk home naked after their belongings were set on fire, others being tied to the roof of cars going full speed down the highway, massive brawls, year-long vendettas, they even say John Scales and Terry Flynn asked to be put on the transfer list because they were simply scared of their teammates. Vinny had finally found a place he could call home. And the stories and success that came from this match made in heaven, or I guess in hell, were otherworldly. In his first seven matches, despite being a defensive midfielder, Jones somehow scored four goals, including strikes against United, Chelsea and even getting revenge on Watford, who had rejected him in his youth. Then, towards the end of the season, while playing Liverpool away, not only did Wimbledon beat them 2-1, but Vinny took the time to go over to the famous This is Hemfield sign, grab a marker and scribble on it, we don't care. Look, those six months were the perfect introduction to his time at Wimbledon, but nothing compared to the following season. First, in a testimonial match, he convinced everyone in the team to flash their butts to the camera, and then, well, then he quite simply took Wimbledon on one of the most memorable FA Cup runs in the history of the sport. After easy wins against West Bromwich and Mansfield Town, Wimbledon faced Newcastle and with a young Paul Gascoigne roaming around, Jones figured the perfect solution to shut him down was to completely freeze him with fear, so the second he saw him, he went up to him and introduced himself. A. I am Vinnie Jones, and if you try to get away from me, I'm gonna bite your ear off and spit it back on the grass. You're all alone with me. And man, he wasn't lying. As Gascoigne would go on to admit, the whole game I felt him breathing down on me like a dragon. It was pure aggression. At one point he went to take a corner, but before that he looked me dead in the eye and said, Don't worry darling, I'll be back. As you might imagine, Wimbledon won, but not before Vinny managed to get a handful of Gascoigne's you-know-what, making for one of the most memorable pictures in the history of English football. Still, their next match against Slotten would be equally as entertaining. So, pretty much coach Bobby Gold caught Vinny Jones stretching out his knee, groaning in pain a few days before the match and got all upset at Jones for hiding his injury, telling him he couldn't play the semi-final. So, Jones did a reasonable thing and pinned him against the wall, smashing his head into the coat hanger, repeatedly insisting that he had to play him. Which was made even worse when the owner of the club contractually forced Gold to start him, leading him to get revenge by subbing Vinny off just 15 minutes into the match. Obviously Vinny didn't take too kindly to that, but thankfully it didn't stop Wimbledon from making the final. It was once again Wimbledon vs Liverpool. The day before, according to Gold, the players wanted to win so bad they were scratching at the walls. It got so stressful, the manager handed them a hundred pounds and told them to go down to the pub and have a pint, hoping they'd calm down. However, even if this time around they were away at Wembley, they didn't shy away at all. They still made sure to go down the tunnel, shouting like cowboys, and once the match started, Vinny wasted no time. 
He jogged around for a second, looked for fellow hard man Steve McMahon, and fearing the referee would not show a red card so early into the final, he established his place as the toughest guy on the pitch by going at him with a tackle so harsh it nearly split him in two. According to his teammate Fashano, that was the moment that won them the match. As he said, that tackle started at his throat and ended at his ankle. Psychologically, we had just won the game. Of course, there was a lot more to it than that. Sanchez scored the winning goal, Beardsley had his own disallowed and Bezant even saved the penalty, but no matter what, once the whistle was sounded, the underdogs had snatched the FA Cup trophy right out of the hands of the champions of England. Leading the commentator to claim The crazy gang have beaten the culture club! As you might have noticed, that nickname stuck. Following one more year at Wimbledon, Vinny left the club aged 25, and though you could tell that sooner or later he'd be forced to make his way back to his beloved crazy gang, it's not like his time away was any more… sane. In the first of his three seasons away, he played at Leeds United, and he was even a key figure in their promotion to the first tier, though in all honesty, that was far from his most memorable moment that season. Because, well, once as he watched some kids put on a show at halftime to entertain the audience, he felt one of them was playing a bit too well, so in his own words, he decided he's gotta go. Saying to his teammate David Batty, watch this, before running in the kid's direction as Batty helplessly shouted no 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 as Jones took the kid out with a slight tackle right as he was about to have a shot on goal. When confronted about the situation, Vinny replied, five years old? That kid looked at least six and look, I'm not apologizing, he should have just stood back up. <laughs> Regardless, the next season he moved again, joining his ex-coach Dave Bassett at Sheffield, where one moment completely overshadowed anything else he did at the club. Sheffield were playing Man City and how else can I say this? The referee sounded the whistle, City took the kickoff, Vinny ran straight into the first player to get a touch on the ball and sent him into the shadow realm, getting hit with a yellow card three seconds into the match. Still, to this day, the fastest yellow card in the history of English football. When they asked him what he thought of his supposed late tackle, he claimed, it might have been too high, too wild, too strong, but after three seconds, I thought it was too bloody late. Still, he moved once more, this time to Chelsea, where his most iconic contributions came first as he yelled out at Prime Minister John Major to sort out the effing interest rates, and then as he organized a club Christmas party where the main event consisted of a game where the objective was to hurl little people as far as possible. Regardless, just three years later, the madman finally made his way back to Wimbledon. I mean, come on, he could not settle down anywhere else for more than a season, clearly he was meant to be there, and with the first season of the Premier League kicking off that year, it was the perfect opportunity. And not only did things get crazy again, they got crazy quick. First, as he was claimed to have brought the players from the class of 92 down to a pub, getting them all hammered the night before the iconic photo shoot, and then as he published a DVD titled Vinnie Jones Soccer's Hard Man, where he enthusiastically commentated over clips of some of the nastiest fouls ever seen, which the FA didn't take too kindly, handing him a fine and a suspended sentence that would have him one step away from a six-month ban at any moment. Though the next year he would mix up the dates and fail to show up at a hearing over his excess actions on the pitch, getting extremely close to actually getting banned, though the FA would ultimately forgive him, which didn't stop a Wimbledon chairman from calling him a mosquito brain. Regardless, despite being 30 years old at this point, there was something even his stone-cold heart yearned for. International football. After all, being as infamous as he was, England refused to touch him. Ireland, who he was illegible to play for through one of his grandparents, did the same, and as it seemed it would be impossible for him to get on the international stage, a last attempt to play for Wales on the account that his maternal grandmother had been born there finally worked out, and though he would only get nine caps throughout his career, the fact he had been made captain by his sixths is enough to show how impactful he was. At club level, however, he still had plenty of time to pull off a few more stunts, first going head-to-head -head against Roy Keane and especially Cantona, hitting him with one of the dirtiest tackles you've ever seen, only for him to get revenge with one of the greatest volleys of all time. I'd say, when you come at the king, you better not miss, but well, Jones clearly hit him, so 
Yeah. The following season, his antics did not disappoint either, at one point going on goal in a match versus Newcastle and shocking everyone by being strangely great at it, and then becoming the first ever player to get sent off three times in a single season. In 98, he finally left Wimbledon, sending the club on a downward spiral that saw them get relegated three seasons later, while Jones joined QPR as a player manager for two seasons before retiring. Strangely enough, then going on to pursue a career in the art world, first releasing an album in 2002 with some not-so-good vocals, and then hitting the jackpot with a massive cinema career, starring alongside the likes of Stallone and Brad Pitt, most often playing the role of the bad guy. Could it be any more appropriate?